Hello, my name is Bob D. Hilster, and I am your particle model guru. Yes, this is the infamous series RLC circuit. My video that I had out there for a day and saw it and looked at it and said, no, no, can't let it out there, and I pulled it back. I apologize to everyone, but uh, it was the right thing to do. So anyway, we're going to talk about the series RL circuit, just like we talked about the series RC circuit. Okay, and this is a typical circuit where you have a, a voltage source, and they show, this is a current model, it shows current flowing this way, uh, with a voltage drop uh, across the inductor and a voltage drop across the resistor. And it has a time constant. If this resistor is one kilo ohm and the inductor is one millihenry, the time constant is actually the product of, uh, or is L over R, L inductance divided by resistance to give one microsecond time constant. And so let's take a look at this. Now we're gonna start actually with a inductor that's already fully charged and it's charged by a in this case a 9 volt battery and it's the size of the battery and the size of the inductor that determines how much charge is going to be put into uh, into the magnetic field around the uh, the inductor now in this case it it was stable and charged and, and uh, the connection was the other way and we to discharge it we throw the switch in this direction and it starts discharging. Now normally when you're charging G1 particles flow in this direction. As soon as you open this circuit there are no G1 particles flowing through here. The magnetic field loses the, loses the uh, excuse me the inductor he loses the uh, the flow of g1s to cause a g2 gravity field which is holding this magnetic field together now as soon as that's gone there is no g2 gravity and this a, a little bit of current might flow this way but you apparently get a lot of current flowing this way and now since the switch is this direction, it, as it flows through the resistor, it loses some of the uh, G1s, they scatter. And as they come through and, uh, through here, there's a tiny bit of resistance here, but mostly you're, you're, the magnetic field is flowing into the wire and going around losing it through here. So you start with uh, amount of charge, that amount of charge determined by the battery and the inductor is, is how much you have to get out of the field in through here and, 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 and dissipated through the resistor. So the combined action of this collapsing from its full value and this dissipating them through a value of, of uh, one kilo ohm and slowly it just the current goes away. Now there is an interesting point about this when you throw the switch from the battery to this position where you're going to discharge. As soon as this opens just a little bit, just a tiny bit, you can get a spark. Uh, some of you uh, older engineers and uh, uh, people worked on cars like I did, because I've done this, uh, had to replace the points in my car because the uh, points, the spark across there kept, is so hot, repeatedly over and over, is so hot that it actually can transfer metal. It's that forceful. It can transfer metal from this contact to this contact and they have to be replaced and cleaned. I also, when I started working in telecommunications, the switches were all, were all electromechanical with some electronics starting to creep in. There were 
relays and, and, and contacts all over the place. This spark was a big problem for the old electromechanical switches. So they had at the earliest form of snubbing, it's called a snubbing circuit, was a capacitor that you put across the contacts and that would divert the current from this way it would it would divert the current around the contacts through here so when it just slightly opened instead of all the current and, and uh, g1s flowing across creating a spark you took a lot of it through the capacitor back to the battery later on when it was developed there were the zener diodes were put in there as snubbing circuits you put them in backwards compared to the polarity nor, nor, normal polarity and they were connected from here all the way over to here. And they would also, during normal operation, the Zener voltage was uh, large enough that uh, it didn't interfere with the circuit. But uh, when, they, when the current went the other way, it would pass it through there. They had snubbing circuits to protect, to protect these contacts. And this is a... Uh, this is for a motor. Uh, this is for an inductive motor waveform, and it shows that when you first open that switch, you get a voltage in the opposite direction because the current's going opposite from the way the battery imposed it, and then it discharges the amount of charge it has plus the resistance being dissipated causes it to discharge that way. That inductive kick is a fast fall time and a slow rise time based on the time constant. Okay, so now we have it fully discharged. And we're going to throw the switch back and we're going we're gonna to charge it. Yes, and here's the famous curve that I got myself all twisted on. I uh, was using uh, this and I was thinking of this as voltage and this one as current when you can clearly see this is current and this is voltage. Graph is a little bit confusing because uh, here where it shows the peak voltage it's got I max and that makes it a little bit confusing but otherwise it, it should have been clear and so what you have here is the current starting at zero building up until it reaches a max and you have the voltage jumping up to the battery voltage then they don't show the battery voltage there and, and coming down to zero that's what happens that's that's we we see that happen all the time and that's what we're going to talk about well there are two ex explanations as to why this uh, whole process works and, and it's the main one is the back emf or counter electromotive force, abbreviated CEMF, also known as back electromotive force or back EMF. And as you know, I'm not a proponent of EMF because nobody tells me what uh, the electromotive force is. And it, 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 but in this case, the back EMF is the force or voltage that opposes the change in current. So they're saying this is what causes the current to move up slowly. And yet at the same time, they tell you it's controlled by the uh, value of the inductance and the resistor. Now here it must be the inductor and this back EMF. That, and, and so the current which is which induced it creates this back EMF and, and it's caused by magnetic induction. Another one that I found on the internet is really just a rule of thumb to help you uh, understand if you forget what's supposed to happen. Uh, they say just remember the inductor has a high value of resistance at the start and then has a low value of resistance when fully charged. Uh, the, the mathematical equation for that is it works. It's uh, it's called uh, it's uh, voltage is equal to uh, L D I D T, which means it's proportional to the rate of change of current. 
uh, well, that's this is just a rule of thumb, uh, but it's the change of current that is uh, the mathematical expression, and, and they don't talk about that here at all. They just use back EMF. Okay, so now we're going to throw the switch this way, and the first thing you got to do is find the G1 base. Circuit isn't going to work. My previous uh, uh, videos indicated that the uh, uh, the first few cycles, uh, the the system, the the battery, the components have to find it. The main point here is the battery doesn't know when I throw this what the, what's out here. How does it know to put out precisely the right G1 base to make this work when it's not even connected? It doesn't know. It can put out too many. It can put out too few. But it but as I described in the previous uh, video. It takes a number of cycles to get to a point where you have this established and when you establish the base then you can start talking about how it behaves according to the curves that they talk about. <coughs> However, you can have two, when you connect it you can have too few. And if you think of, of if you think about that right off the bat, if you have too few, you're not going to get a nine volt drop here, and you're clearly going to get uh, zero here. But it's not going to reach nine volts if it's too few. If for some reason it puts out too many, you're going to get what I call an overshoot. So at any way, you, you take the number of cycles, you establish this, and then we can talk about how it charges. Here's an overshoot. This is uh, about an inductive uh, a motor here as, as well. And this is just a graphic. It's not an actual picture of an overshoot, but in the case where a, an insulated gate bipolar transistor, which is a fast acting transistor, puts a sharp control signal into the inductor, they get this overshoot. Uh, kind of. They used to tell me that, well, it just gets it going, it keeps going. Uh, <coughs> not very satisfactory answer. Uh, the question is, why, why would there even ever be an overshoot? My answer is the G1 base. There are many, many more G1 particles flowing through the circuit, even once it's established properly, that allows for the loss of more than 90 G1 particles through the inductor. And when you have more than 90, if you have 135, then you got 13 and a half volts. If you have 180, you've doubled it, and you got twice the peak. It's the G1 base. Yeah, that can cause an overshoot. Or if there's not enough, you're going to have an undershoot. Interesting point. Okay, so now we're charging. Once the G1 base is established, and this, uh, the circuit will behave as expected. There is no magnetic field at this point. We're, we're assuming there's none. And so the first cycle through, there's, since there's no magnetic field, as many as uh, can will leave the wire, the core, the inductor, and sneak out the side, so to speak, uh, because the G1 particle is moving like a spiral through that wire, and it and and some of it sneaks out, and so you're going to lose maybe in the first cycle, you're going to lose all that's possible to lose out of the ones flowing through there. At least the ones on the surface of the wire. I'm not showing the surface, the, the uh, area. If you look at the area of the, uh, of the, uh, the wire, uh, most of the ones that are escaping are escaping from the surface. The ones in the middle don't make it out so good. So immediately you get a whole bunch coming out and, and, and how I, you would know that it would be exactly 90. The only way you can predict that it's going to be 90 initially is if it's got the right base. Otherwise that circuit will be, it'll have too few or too many. 
So you lose a few here, and and uh, many of them go through. But uh, if you did lose 90 G1s, you'd have zero. Uh, you'd have a, a, a zero loss here. G1 base only without the 90 is going to give you zero volt drop, as I've described before. So initially, they all kind of load uh, fill up the magnetic field. The second cycle around. Since you've built up a little bit of a magnetic field, uh, it you're, you've got the same base, but you can't get as many out because there's some already there. So instead of losing 90, you lose uh, maybe uh, 85. That means more get through. If more get through, then you start having more loss against the resistor, and you go around again, and the next time you lose the magnetic field builds up and now you can only lose 80 and then 70 then 60 and each time you lose more more pass through then you can you get a bigger voltage drop here because you got more coming in you get a bigger drop here and it keeps going that way uh, putting less and less each time through into the magnetic field until you're fully charged so it's the combination of how many you lose. Now, what about that back EMF? The back EMF is supposed to slow the current. By the way, initially when you have zero voltage drop across this zero, you have zero current. As you get more and more uh, uh, G1 particles coming through and building up and you get more, more voltage drop, you're getting more current. That explains the current wave. Initially, you, if you drop 90 and less and less and less, that explains the voltage curve. So anyway, uh, that's when it is fully charged and uh, we're gonna go on to a, a description here. There's the waveform. Uh, once you got the G1 base established, you got nine volts across here and it's as, it, as the magnetic field builds up, you can push in less. It's not necessarily the back EMF. Let me go back, however. Uh, well, no, that's, that's forward. Uh, it, let me just stick with the voltage. It, it starts at not, you lose 90, then 80, then 60, then zero. The voltage drop across the resistor is zero and builds up to uh, nine volts and that reflects a current which is equal to volts over R. Yes, okay, now you're fully charged and I wanted to talk about the back EMF and I'm using this one because as you build up a magnetic field you, you get a magnetic field that's going around and through this way and around and through this way. I'm doing it wrong way, go around and through, up through the middle and out, down through the outside, up through the middle and down through the outside. That could be perceived as a back EMF. Uh, they don't call it that way. Uh, and, and it could mitigate against the build, this buildup of the uh, G1. So there might be something to do with back EMF here as it's being charged. However, uh, uh, they uh, completely miss the fact that the G1 particles are needed or get lost in the charging process by sneaking out and, and building that magnetic field. So there's probably two effects here. The loss of G1s into the magnetic field and the uh, mitigating force of this magnetic field against this flow of current. Okay, so now it's fully charged, and the amount of number of G1 particles stored in the inductor is based on how what the battery voltage is, what the size of the inductor is, the rate at which it happens is based on R, and based on the, this process of building the magnetic field. Okay, uh, so in summary, I know it's been a while since I've talked about the RC circuit, but in both cases, I want to mention first the battery. Battery does not know, whether it's an RL circuit or an RC circuit, the battery doesn't know 
how much bass to do. In both cases, it's got to find the bass. Once it finds the bass, it can start behaving as we say it does. For the inductor, when it's charging, the G1s are stored in a magnetic field as a G1 stream. Discharging, the G1 stream flows backwards into this circuit, losing G1 particles through the resistor. EMF, if you, if the particle model suggests that there is no specific EMF, there's only a G1 stream, and that when they talk about a forward EMF or a voltage being provided, we're saying no, they're G1 streams from the battery. The back, EM, back EMF during the uh, collapse of the magnetic field or as it's charging are streams of G1s from the magnetic field. So it, uh, clearly they are the G1 particles are stored in the inductors in the magnetic field. In the case of the capacitor, the when you charge it, the G ones st are stored as dielect uh, in the dielectric as G one orbitals, not as a magnetic field as an orbital. When they discharge, it's D G two gravity inside the capacitor that pushes the G ones into back into the circuit, causing the inductive kick. Uh, from the capacitor in this case, which you can also get. And uh, these, uh, as well, anyway, that's it. it pushes them. What I was trying to get to was that just this G2 gravity inside the capacitor looks very much like the electric field that is talked about. I was saying, you know, they don't describe what an electric field is. They just said it, it exists between a plus and minus uh, sign, uh, plus sign and a minus sign. And I'm saying, no, it's a G2 gravity field inside pushing it. And in, in the, uh, as far as the EMF, it's, it is still a stream. The forward EMF comes from the battery. The back EMF is the internal G2 gravity pushing the orbitals out of the dielectric into the, the uh, circuit and back through the resistor to discharge. That's my summary of the RL and RC circuit. My name is Bob D. Hilster and I am your particle model guru. Tune in next time when I'll explain more of the universe using the particle model. Thank you for your attention.